Hi there, come on in. I'm Fred Trost. I'd like you to join me here on Michigan Outdoors this evening. We have a real treat here. Brandy, a yellow lab pup. And look at this. Have you ever seen a perch this large? I doubt it. But you're going to hear what it really is in just a second, because it's Thursday night, time for Michigan Outdoors. Don Hodenka, you're the lucky angler from Mount Clements. You caught this 11-pound, 10-ounce, what looks like a giant perch. It is a perch, isn't it, Ned Fogel? How about a walleye? Well, it's in the perch family. Right. Okay, a large cousin of the yellow perch, a walleye. And, of course, Don, what do a lot of people in Canada call this fish? They call it a pickerel. A pickerel. Why is that, Ned? Well, they call it a pickerel. Some of them call it a walleye pike. A lot of people evidently think this looks, this fish looks a lot like the pike, but of course they're no relation at all. Of course, they're separate families. The walleye refers to its eyeballs, which are a little different than the average right, fish. Right. It's it's the difference in makeup of the rods and cones in the back of the eye, which uh, enables the walleye to see well in very dim light conditions, and this gives it that opaqueness that it has. Uh, well, Don, what's the story on this fish? How and where and when did you catch it? I caught this fish on uh, November 29th in Lake St. Clair off the Dolphin Channel. November 29th? What are you, crazy? Fishing at the end of November? <laughs> well, usually this is the best time to catch big fish like this. Is we that right? fish November and it's very hot. Your fishing technique is rather interesting. It is not a rod and reel technique. It's more or less a reel technique with some heavy uh, wire line. And you ran off of this line with a big sinker, a rapala little teeny lure like that. Is this the best lure that you find for catching a uh, walleye? We use the rapala usually in early spring and late fall. Okay, and the rapala resembles a minnow, right, Ned? Minnow, and I think that's probably why it's one of the, uh, an excellent bait for the walleye. Well, you have a quite a heavy sinker on this, Don, for fishing in the Detroit River where the current is fairly stiff. Do you fish right on the bottom or how far off the bottom? We fish right on the bottom. Uh, Usually we use a 40-foot leader and a 20-foot leader when it's usually uh, six inches, four inches off the bottom. You mean your lure is 40 feet behind the weight? That's right. Wow. That's an interesting technique and hand lining it in. Is there much of a battle with walleye when you fish them like this? Well, something like this size is, yes. It, uh, it's more like a heavy log coming in. Well, why do you fish it for walleye then this way? Because of the current and in the contour of the bottom. But I mean, why walleye? Why does Dando Hodenka go out and fish walleye rather than pike, rather than muskie? Because of the eating quality of the fish. You like them, eh? Absolutely. Fishermen like walleye too, don't they, Ned? We have an awful lot in this state. And uh, eating quality is one of the, probably the primary reason there. There, of course, are very nice looking fish. They're uh, in a fair fighter, and that, but it's the eating quality that really makes them highly desirable. Well, thank you, Ned Fogel from the DNR. Don Hodinka, congratulations on this 11 pound, 10 ounce master angler fish. We found out about the fish through the master angler program. Congratulations. Thank you, Fred. Now let's go to Ed Groves and dip into our mail bag, Ed, and find out what our viewers have to say. Well, Fred, we got a lot of mail about Tom Washington and his proposal to extend and split the deer season. From Steve Thompson of Charlotte, I don't agree with it at all. Seasons for hunting deer and small game are already confusing. Solution, raise the bag limit to two or three per license, buck or doe, but the same season. Bob Gladys from Cooks says the reasoning is sound and long overdue. The greatest obstacle to overcome will be the biologist, director, and the DNR commission. Let's encourage a break with tradition. Please do what you can for change. We pay enough on licenses to voice our views. And from Dale Odgers of Hancock, I know for a fact that the people in Upper Michigan, especially in the Copper Country, will want it to stay just the way it is. Forget the dough permits. There are enough poachers that will take care of enough doughs as it is. And Howard Shook from Sidnaw, in the first place, I don't have much use for the MUCC since they led the fight to outlaw the bounty on coyotes. By the way, whatever happened to the thousands of dollars the DNR was going to save by not paying bounties? And that's it from our mailbag. Well, some pretty good questions and good comments. Some people say they don't have much use for the MUCC. We have two MUCC staffers right here, Wayne Schmidt and uh, Tim Eater, and we're going to illustrate an issue right now because of the controversies. MUCC is an organization, association of 430 sportsmen's clubs. So when they vote on an issue like snagging, which was a controversy, some of the clubs are pro, some are con, and it isn't a cut and dried issue by any means. Now snagging is where your people use hooks like this to toss out into a river to what's called foul hook, 
a salmon, hook him in the body, rather than enticing them to hit with a lure or a bait. And snagging is, is quite a controversy, so for the purposes here of our discussion, Wayne, you're going to take the which side? The pro-snagging side. Pro-snagging. Tim, you take the anti-snagging. Let's start out with the first question here. Does snagging attract rowdy and unsportsmanlike conduct? Well, yeah, you bet it does, because uh, by the very nature of snagging, there's no skill involved. People don't have to stalk or sneak up on their fish. So all the snaggers just go wherever the, the fish are in the highest concentration. And whenever you've got a lot of, of fishermen going after a limited number of fish, you get pushing and shoving and fighting and unsportsmanlike behavior. Pro snaggers, what do they say? Well, snagging's crowded, sure, but that just proves how popular it really is. Why, the thing I can't figure out is why when a bunch of genteel fly fishermen get together and tramp down the banks of the Osalba River, that's overcrowding. But when snaggers might do the same thing, suddenly that's on sportsmanlike behavior. Well, that's the point of view on that, the two points of view on that. Now, what about is snagging the only way to catch salmon in the streams? What about the pro-snagging side? People catch salmon and other fish in all sorts of different ways, some more effective than others. But yes, Fred, when those fish enter the rivers, they quit feeding, they head upstream to spawn, and they die, and that's it. And on many rivers, snagging is the only way to harvest the bulk of those fish. Well, that's, that's not totally true. It's true that they don't feed when they enter the rivers, but they can be enticed into striking a lure. And the fishery is relatively young. We're still, we're still learning techniques for harvesting them. And as we learn more and more about the techniques and about the fish, we'll become more proficient. Why can't snaggers learn to fish uh, conventional techniques? <laughs> Those are the two points of view on that. What, well, why not utilize these salmon? They're going to die anyway. Well, just because we don't snag them, that doesn't mean that, th that we won't utilize them. As we become more proficient, we will take the bulk of the fish. And it's not like they're just going to go to waste anyway. The fish do reproduce. And in Michigan streams, where they have been planted, the Chinook are reproducing. What do you think about that for pro-snagging point of view? This is a planted fishery. The natural reproduction is just a drop in the bucket. And you have to remember that in four out of five of the rivers that were open to snagging this year, there are dams blocking those fish's migration. They hit those dams, they're blocked, and they die. And this is a way to conserve those fish. And that's what it's all about, wise use of our natural resources. But another question, though, pro-snagging point of view, is that snagging affects the population of steelhead and lake trout, other fish in the streams. Well, that's true. Uh, steelhead have a tendency to follow the salmon upstream. They feed on the eggs of the salmon. And we've had numerous reports of fishermen catching steelhead that have had hunks of their bodies ripped out by snaggers. And snagging also blocks the upstream migration of, of trout and, uh, and salmon just by the nature of the thrashing around in the water. Now, the incidental take of other species is really insignificant. And I just can't believe that these Pacific Coast salmon that are programmed by nature to swim 2,000 miles up the Continental Divide to spawn are going to get blocked by a bunch of fishing lines in the water. OK, then there's the question of, of is money going to be lost by localities and by the sport fishing industry if we outlaw snagging? And of course, the pro snaggers say, oh, yes, because we're not going to go to Ludington in those places. Anti snaggers say, oh, no, because the fishermen will develop and go other places and fish legally. But it boils down to one ethical question Is snagging an unsportsmanlike, unethical way of catching fish? What do you say, anti snagging point of view? Well, the majority of sport fishermen think, <clears throat> yes, it is an unsportsmanlike means. There's no skill involved, no challenge. Look, we don't allow snagging for, for other species, for trout and pike. Why does the salmon deserve any less respect as a game fish? You know, you talk about ethics, Fred. You know, what e ethics? Who, who's going to make that decision? These are just ordinary people wanting to go out and have a good time and catch some fish. You talk about unethical behavior. What, are they moral outcasts or what? Hey, that's the question. We're going to stop it right here. Wayne Schmidt and Tim Eater presenting the pro and con point of view on snagging. What is your opinion? Should the Natural Resources Commission continue snagging, or should it be outlawed altogether, as many sportsmen propose? Write us, Michigan Outdoors, Box 1, East Lansing, 48823. We'll put your views on air here, and we'll also make sure your letters go to those people who are making the decisions. Now we're going to go to something a little more mellow, a method of catching pike on tip-ups from Don Phillips from Lowell. This was tip-up town in a previous year, done uh, through the camera of Bob Bishop, and he's going to show us how he uses tip-ups to catch pike. Quite a lot of ice here today. We've got, we've got about 20 inches of it. Get down through there. Get the slush out of the hole here.
Now we'll take and locate bottom here so we can set our depth. Dan uses a standard ice fisherman's clip-on weight to get his hook to the bottom quickly. He wants to fish off the bottom a few feet and he uses this weight just to test the depth. It'll come up about two foot. So we're set just about two foot off the bottom. Now we'll set the tip up here so we don't lose the, our depth. Now we'll bring it up here and get the weight off and get us a minnow. Pike fishermen use live minnows for bait, usually sucker minnows or shiners. In the summer, live minnows are one way to catch pike. In the winter, they're about the only way. Get this, get this shiner out here and using the treble hook. We'll get him just in under the back bone. Don't want to hit the bone and kill him. He's nice and lively. Now we'll drop him down in here and feed the line in carefully. That's what happens when the fish hits. set it down in and wait for the fish to come along and set it off so we can come and get him. Let's go over and check one of the other tip-ups that we've got set and we will clean that and get the ice out. A lot of people seem to be concerned about the snowmobile noise but really doesn't seem to bother them up here too much despite being in the shallow water. Now you've got to keep the ice out of the holes and keep them clean periodically or else they freeze up and they won't work. And we check and make sure our minnow is... We we'll check and make sure our minnow here is live. Well, this one has got down into the... into the weeds. So we have to bring it up and get the weeds off. And I'll bring it up just a little farther off the bottom so he doesn't get back into them. I'm fishing right over a weed bed here. Because the, uh, the pike prefer to be right around the weed bed here because this is where the minnows and stuff congregate in. Now on here we have a, a treble hawk <coughs> with a steel leader. When the pike grabs these, you'll get the minnow and the hook all the way in the mouth. And if you do not have the steel leader on here, if you just got the nylon like up here, he's going to cut through on the sharp teeth. So we get the leader on here. It's a small one. It doesn't have to be too long. And use just a light weight up above. Use too heavy a weight when the pike trips this. The weight will drop right down in front of him, and it's going to scare him. So use just enough to keep your minnow down. Set it back in so the wind won't tip it over. And we should be all set. Yeah, you run a little bit. Yep, there he is. <laughs> Just a little bit small. Well, 14 inches. Now if we can get the hook out of him. Ouch. Well, we'll put him back to grow another day. Well, he'll be bigger one of these days. Now we'll have to get our minnow and start all over. 
Tip-up fishing is usually done from a shanty. Obviously, the tip-ups are outside, but fishermen and fisherwomen seem to prefer a warm place to sit and watch for tip-up flags to pop up and wave in the breeze. In Michigan, each fisherman is allowed to set out only two tip-ups, which is another reason many die-hard ice fishermen like a warm shanty. That way, they can talk their wives into coming along. That means another two tip-ups that can be set out in hopes of attracting that lunker. We did pretty good today. We got these four northerns. We got this one here about 9 o'clock this morning. That's 28 inches. Then about 11 o'clock, we got these other three right in a hurry. This one's about 28 also. Then these two are about 21 inches. They've got to be 20 inches to be legal, so we haven't did too bad. That's Don Phillips from Lowell sharing his ice fishing techniques with us up at Tip Up Town, taking some of the mystery out of tip up fishing for pike, something you can do on a Michigan weekend. And don't expect every pike to be a lunker or even a keeper, but if you pick a good lake, you should have some action, and there's no better time to get out than this weekend in Michigan outdoors. Nancy, what's going on here? <laughs> She's just playing, Fred. We She's was, not going to hurt you. We were just sitting here watching this uh, tip-up story, and Brandy, a little yellow lab, who's normally the little sweetest thing in the world, decides that uh, she wants to play. How old is she? She's 87 days old today, uh -huh. which is four months. And just turned into a frisky just little thing. <laughs> Golly, well, Brandy is a yellow lab, the niece of Cochise. Right. Oh, I should introduce you, Nancy Chris from Goodrich on Metamora, in that area, and you uh, raise, breed Labrador Retrievers. Yes, we do. And that is Coach Chase, not a run-of-the-mill uh, Labrador Retriever, but a real champion, Yes, right? he is. He's a field champion, amateur field champion. He's accumulated almost over 40 points. Well, what about this breed, Labrador Retrievers? They're becoming quite popular. Why? They've always been really kind of popular. They're just, you know, the temperament of the dog. They're very good retrievers on upland game, uh, waterfowl, you know, all-around good pet. So you trained Cochise to retrieve mm -hmm. and run them in field trials and so on. Right. Why don't we illustrate a little? In fact, I want to get Brandy here off my case. Brandy, if I toss this out, would she? Well, put her down on the floor first. Oh, here, you take it. Okay. Okay, Brandy, we're going to try to work Cochise. off some of this vinegar. Hey, Brandy. Hey, 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 hey. Ho, ho, ho. Oh, what a good girl. And look at that. She brings it right back. That's the way a retriever's supposed to work. Why don't you hold that sock in your mouth for a bit? Ooh. Yeah, I'd appreciate that, chewing that. Now, what about that Cochise, though? Cochise is used to a lot of the long-range retrieving. Yes, he is. Like, there's, there's a retriever dummy. Toss it out there training for dummy. Him. Yes. Okay, Cochise, sit. Sit. Now, you stay. Stay. Back. Heel. Heel. Now, sit. And a boy. And that's the way a retriever is supposed to react. Retrieve the dummy, come back, sit. Deliver the hand. When you call Soft for mouth, it. Soft mouth, yes. That's, sit. That must take a lot of training. It does take a lot of training. You're talking probably a good three to five years to train a really good professional field trial dog. And how old is Cochise? Cochise is eight. Do you keep Cochise in the house? We do now. You know, periodically when he's being trained, he stays out in the kennel. But now he's earned a good rest in the house. Is it okay to keep a hunting dog in the house from your point of view? I think it is. It depends on the dog and the personality of the people who have it. I think it's a good idea to keep them in the house. Well, Labradors uh, are generally docile dogs. You don't see them used as guard dogs and, and things like no, that. No, you don't. They use them a lot for leader dogs and that type of thing, but they're, they're just a very good all-around house pet. Now, you have trained coaches to operate by hand signals, right? Isn't that yes. what really makes the, the champions? It does. They have to know how to handle, you know, sit on the whistle, take left cast, right cast, backs, and that type of thing. And sometimes the blinds, which are hidden birds out in a field with changes of cover, ditches, and that type of thing, are around 300 yards long. So that dog will go 300 yards, come back, look at you, you give the signal and he goes and finds the bird. Right. Well, quite a talented dog, and Brandy, you're talented too. Uh, these dogs are sometimes not usually used for hunting quail and grouse and pheasants, right? Well, they are used for hunting uh, grouse and pheasants. But maybe not to the extent of setters and right. some of the pointers. Right. Have you ever hunted grouse with uh, Cochise? No, I haven't had the opportunity to. Have you ever cooked grouse? No, I haven't. Well. Hey, do I have a treat for you, Nancy oh, Chris. Good. We're going to go to a recipe right now that I prepared a few years ago in, in my pickup camper. It's mm. called Elegant Grouse. Sounds delicious.
So here we go inside the camper. You know, it's amazing, Nancy, the, the things that you can cook over a campfire, uh, out of a hunting camp up north, or, uh, you know, wherever. Pick up campers, trailers. All you need is a few basic ingredients for this recipe, called elegant grouse. Need some pepper, some garlic salt, uh, need some sour cream, uh, and some flour, which we already got some fresh mushrooms to put on top. And we'll need a little bit of wine as well. We put the rice on the side, some mushroom soup, a can of mushroom soup. Of course, that wine, if you read the label, you can be real patriotic here to Michigan Outdoors and use some Michigan wine. The only kind to use. So what we have to do is get the grouse. You know, I got the rest of the recipe together. So what do you do, Nancy, if you're, uh, if you're up in the North Woods or, or anywhere and you want a pizza? Well, you usually call out for a pizza. That's right. So uh, logically, what would you do for a grouse if you didn't have it? Well, I guess if you hadn't shot it, you'd probably have to call out sure, for it. Sure, call out. Go. <laughs> You're probably wondering where I called. I certainly well, am. You're probably going to wonder when you see it delivered, too. Uh -oh. But back to the recipe here. We take the sour cream, about a half pint of sour cream, put it in a mixing bowl, and then we'll take uh, four tablespoons of flour. Mm -hmm. One, two, three, four. And you mix this together. And this is uh, the basis for the sauce we're going to make to put over the meat. By the way, you don't need grouse particularly. You could probably use it with pheasant, although it's good with the white-meated birds. You know, mm -hmm. grouse, quail, chicken breasts, boneless chicken breasts are excellent with this recipe. Now for the wine. Oh, right, the best part. You should try to pour most of it into the cup and into the recipe. Mm -hmm. Of course, but we'll take a cup of white wine, put it in here, and uh, add a can of mushroom soup. So it's very simple, right? Very simple. Sounds very good. Those are, those are the basic ingredients, except for, uh, of course, our garlic, salt, and pepper. But doggone it, you know, i got to have the grouse. Yes, you do. Got to call back and find out what is the holdup here. I have an important recipe. Uh, this show is only 28 minutes, 46 seconds long, and we got to get the grouse here right away. So we'll put the mushroom soup in here, and I, they told me that the grouse is on its way. It should be here any minute but not to be disappointed if it wasn't grouse. Oh, okay. I don't know, I tell you, these, some of these backwoods delivery services, you uh, some, you sometimes you'll wonder. But well, we put the salt, or the garlic salt and the black pepper in there and stir it around to a creamy consistency. Good. Now the delivery boy. Uh -oh. oh boy, I said, uh, maybe I'm getting a pizza. I don't know what's coming now. But I guess he's doing his best. Where did you call this guy from? I don't think I'm going to give him any more business. You know, I'd give you the number, Nancy, really, but I don't mm. think it deserves any more business. But here he is, conscientious on the job, and uh, I just wonder what we're going to get. As far as I know, that must be the package. This delivery boy must have a lot of, a lot of stops to make, but, uh, you know, I was going to give him a tip. Well, I was gonna. I mean, he's so well-dressed. Yes, very smart. But he didn't even stick around so I could talk with him. Off he went, and I found the package on the back steps. I guess he was in a hurry. He looks like he was. That's all I can figure. I would really much prefer to go out and shoot the grouse myself or the quail. Of course, we don't have a quail season in Michigan. No, we don't. No, because the past couple winters have uh, been so so, well, a, a few winters ago was so bad, we've had a couple that were pretty decent. But those bad winters we had just wiped out the quail population. Well, that's what I got, quail. Had to come from Mississippi, though. No wonder it took him so long. That's for sure. You take the quail or the grouse or the chicken breasts and put them in a baking dish like this. Just line them up. If, if any sticks out the top, you should try to lay it down or fold it over so you don't have to get into basting it too much. Mm -hmm. And pour that sauce over the top. Nice Remember, it has nice. sour cream, mm -hmm. flour, white wine, garlic, salt, pepper, and one can of mushroom soup. Looks great. You bet that's good. Pop it into the oven. What would you say? For how long? About an hour, maybe. Oh, Three an hours. hour and a half is what I cooked it at at 350. Now we want to get the other condiments here for the meal. This is a, a special meal, so you'll want to get some green vegetable, maybe like peas. How about a cherry pie for dessert? A good Michigan cherry pie? You bet it's a Michigan cherry pie. Did you know, Nancy, that uh, over 90% of the red tart cherries that people eat anywhere in the world come from the Traverse City area, basically, yes. in Michigan? Very good. We are number one, no doubt about that. Well, we'll mix up some rice. 
wild rice if you prefer, or white rice. Slice up the mushrooms. Serve this elegant grouse on the bed of rice with a fresh mushroom sliced on top. And I tell you, it is fantastic. It looks great. It really is. It's a real hit. And you don't have to worry about the, the small bones, say, in something like a quail. Although it's nice to serve boneless meat this way, but uh, cooked in that manner, that moist method of cooking, just uh, so tender, comes right off the bone. Noticed I had to dress up a little bit. You do look nice. I love the tie. What about the lack of a stash? I miss that. I do like you? the stash, well, yes. Well, thank you, Nancy. What about the lack of hair? Oh, I Nowadays. think your hair's great. <laughs> I wasn't fishing for compliments, <laughs> but this recipe, I should get some compliments on this recipe because it is terrific. Looks like a good Northwoods recipe. It sure is. Elegant grouse, something that you can serve. Thank you, Ed. <laughs> we'll get the dogs back in here. Sit. Little squirrely dogs Stay. here. What about, uh, where's that training dummy? Ed, will you toss that to me? What? Sit. Do you think, do you think that Brandy would chase the training dummy? I think she probably would, Let's yes. see what she you does, because she wanted to do it before. Let's see if she can pick it up. Atta girl. Come on, Brandy. Well, while Brandy Come works on. on that, let me tell you what's coming up this weekend in Michigan Outdoors for our weekend forecast. Get that dummy there, Brandy. The Upper Peninsula, we got two to three feet of snow up here, plenty for snowmobiling and cross-country skiing. In the Northern Lower Peninsula, we have uh, for anywhere from a foot to two feet. Uh, the Gaylord area has two feet of snow. Over in Ludington is a real heavy spot, two feet of base with two feet of powder snow. The Southern Michigan doesn't have as much, but the most concentration is in the Southwest. That's the lowdown. This weekend looks good. It's gonna be a cold one, but I hope you join me next week right here Thursday night for Michigan Outdoors. Shore and woodlands of the north, its history of copper mines and iron ore, the Great Lakes fisheries. To the farmlands of the southern counties, we look around again, and all that waits the sportsman in the state of Michigan. And sometimes, when the moon brings out the diamonds in the snow, and the stillness of the forest lies encased in Arctic cold, the wind might whisper through the trees, Listen if you can. Tells you of the beauty in the state of Michigan. Hi there, I'm Fred Trost. If you don't recognize me, certainly you recognize Brandy, the star of Michigan Outdoors, at least on last week's show. Brandy, you're a cutie, a Labrador retriever. But this week coming up on Michigan Outdoors, we have some mallard ducks. You'll love to get after those, retrieve those when you get a little older. We have controversial issues, a recipe for venison soup, all sorts of things, a weekend forecast. So join me right here on Michigan Outdoors on Thursday night. <laughs>